and welcome to this, another episode of Frame and Reference. I'm your host, Kenny McMillan, and you're listening to episode 105 with Crescenzo Notarale, ASC AIC, about his work on Picard. Enjoy. I mean, I'm sure you've been pretty busy, but I know. have you found any time to watch anything cool yourself? Well, you know, it's interesting, uh, you know, with this time of the strikes going on, there's been a lot of time, so the mind is wandering left and right. How I preoccupy my my downtime is my personal photography. You know, that's very, very important to me. That's my my creative release. I'm in the process of uh, doing a new book on my images, and uh, that's what I've been doing with my downtime. Uh, but, you know, there's so much beautiful content out there. It's kind of hard to keep track right now. But this is what we do for a living. So I, I watch a lot of television, especially at night, you know, just to keep my ears and eyes to the ground as to what's going on, who's doing what, what's out there, what's stimulating me. Um, so it's it's been daunting. You know, there's a lot of wonderful shows out there. I've, I've loved the show uh, visually uh, very much. It hasn't been on this particular season, but just freshly off last season called Euphoria. I love oh, that sure. show. It's, yeah. it's a lot of visual stimulation. I just totally love that show. And of course, Succession. I've been watching Succession. Um, I think that's the greatest ensemble that we've had this year so far. Um, you know, I also did a show other than Picard. I also did a show a show called Your Honor uh, mm -hmm. for Showtime yeah. with Brian Cranston, and that was a great really show. fantastic show to work on. Thank you, Kenny. Uh, great ensemble as well. Uh, I've been infatuated watching this documentary on um, I think it's HBO. Yes, HBO called The Hundred Foot Wave. And I interviewed the DPs of that. Is that right? Yeah, they yeah. Do a fantastic job, and it's it's daunting to watch these people riding these cavernous waves straight down like a cliff, straight down. I don't know how gravity is holding them onto the water, and then as they're going straight down, you see this gigantic shadow, this grim reaper, just looming over your back, ready to eat you alive. And one mistake, you're, you're like almost dead. I don't know how these people hold their breaths for like five minutes on the water, you know, in a washing machine that way and getting turned and tumbled. Uh, so I've been very infatuated with that. Uh, but I do tip my hat off to uh, Succession. Uh, I super loved what was going on. I did enjoy the finale very much. I did raise my hand to the finale. I was very content with that finale. And uh, my show too, you know, uh, with Your Honor prior to Picard. And also Picard, you know, we had some great finales. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of great, wonderful content out there, Kenny. And, you know, I don't call it the golden age of television. I think, you know, I call it now the platinum age of television. And I'm so honored, uh, deeply honored to be part of the television community because, as you know, the creative content and the buy, uh, the bar, I'm so, excuse me, the bar and the caliber uh, and the people involved is at its utmost top level. And yeah. therefore, you have to pay attention. You have to be really sharp. Uh, you cannot be complacent. Uh, you got to walk onto the set, doing your homework, having a tremendous, tremendous involvement in your prep. Uh, so when you do walk onto this set, uh, you are very, very well adverse as to what's going on to answer any kind of questions that come up, come about. And to do your job, because, you know, it's daunting. When you walk onto that set this day, you know, you look over your shoulder, you know, it is 200 people there. There's, you know, 19 tractor trailers full of equipment. There's, if you're outside exterior day, the sun is rotating. And all of a sudden, if you're behind with one shot, your schedule, all of a sudden, a light starts to change. And it becomes very daunting. So you got to really be prepared. Yeah. Uh, so I, I enjoy that. I'm very proud to be part of this community and you know what the uh, with this new way of watching television, this so-called binge watching, um, it was a funny term at the beginning, but I personally enjoy that because uh, when you're watching a, a show in a chapter of a novel, you don't want to just stop right there sometimes and wait until an entire week goes by. You want to read and see a couple of chapters at a time. Uh, so that's a wonderful thing that we have in the television genre. And obviously the community of all the high directors and the DPs and everybody that does feature films, they're all coming into this genre right now because, you know, you have a lot of legs to the stories, to the arcs. You can tell a larger story. You can get people in, more involved grabbing into their hearts, 
keeping them sustained, keeping them interested. And it's really fantastic feeling when one episode ends that in your heart and soul, you really want to know what's going on in the next episode. So it keeps you alert, keeps you alive, keeps you entertained. And um, I'm proud to be part of this community. And I'm very proud to be part of this interview as well, Kenny. Thank you. Because, you know, as a below the line member, you know, very rarely we get the recognition and the support, the pat on the backs as to the amount of hard work what we do. You know, in my opinion, we're the backbone. We are the backbone of the community. Without below the line, without us, you're not going to have this this kind of content, this kinds of of television, this kinds of entertainment. You know, you can have the greatest story in the world and the greatest actors in the world and the greatest directors in the world and all this great information and content and stories in the world. But if you cannot execute it and to put it onto the screen for people to watch physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, you're not going to have anything. So it's the below the line people that uh, I tip my hat to uh, that are truly the backbones of this community. Uh, so I'm very proud, you know, that this recognition of this interview and this little tap on my back about the show um, is is really nice. I, I really uh, appreciate that very much, Kenny. Thank you. Oh yeah, of course. I mean, that's that's why I made it was, uh, uh, you know, plenty of interviews uh, all over the internet about how oh, um, you know, we talked to this director about how they crafted the show, and I'm like, every once in a while you get, you know, who did um, Barry? Uh, what's his name? Um, the comedian. Oh, for heaven's sake. Yes, from Saturday Night Live, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, in any case, he he does a very good job of, like, he does. calling out even the dolly grip, you know, who made a, a shot work. He's he's very curious about that. But I did want to, uh, you know, uh, up top you had mentioned, um, if we're going to go back to image making uh, at its core, that you were um, doing more still photography. And I was wondering, because I had heard in an interview that you, uh, you know, do a lot of still photography and you have hundreds if not thousands of photo books yes i was one and i was wondering what um if maybe you had some essential photo books you could share and then also who uh has influenced you photographically and and kind of the um well i have follow-ups for that but i'll get you started there well you know it's photography is very very important to me obviously because i'm a cinematographer uh, sometimes, you know, when I give seminars and young filmmakers and young cinematographers ask me that quintessential first question, what does it take to be a cinematographer? And the very, very first thing I say immediately is you have to be a photographer first. You have to walk around with a camera on you at all times, whether it's a, you know, a pocket camera in your pocket, uh, an iPhone in your pocket, a DSLR camera around your shoulder, whatever it may be. And you have to walk around and take pictures, pictures, pictures every day, like brushing your teeth, like tying your shoelace, like putting on your T-shirts every morning. You have to take pictures every single day. And you may take 50 pictures one day. The next day, you're taking 100 pictures. The next day, 200 pictures. And then all of a sudden, like after a week or two, you will realize after 200, 500 pictures, maybe you have three Photograph. So they ask you, okay, so what's the difference between a picture and a photograph? A photograph is something that you sustain your interest when you're turning a magazine or a book. When you just stare at it just a beat longer than you do with a a magazine, for instance. These are pictures. We all take pictures, but not everyone takes a photograph. And a photograph is a narrative that you want to evoke within that four lines, that box, that story within that frame, you want to evoke and tell a story, a narrative, and not necessarily sometimes what's within that box, but sometimes what's outside of that box um, to allure, to evoke. And when you're taking pictures every day, all of a sudden you find yourself, okay, I'm going to explore. Maybe I'm going to get on my belly on a street and look up at something. Or maybe I'm going to climb a tree or get on the second story of a building and look down on something rather than just taking everything eye level. Yeah. And that's the difference between photographs and pictures. All of a sudden now your composition starts to change. You know, then you get a sense of your backgrounds and your shapes within the frame ge- geometrically. There's a lot of geom- uh, geometry within the composition. 
You know, I'm looking at you straight on, but if I move my body lower and look up at you, I'm giving you presence, all right? If I get my body to the side a little and maybe dutch the camera just slightly, maybe I will accentuate the lines in the background of what I'm looking at just to stretch it a bit more, just to bring more attention to it. That's composition. That's photography. You have to know these principles before you become a cinematographer because I'm very daunted that there's a lot of great cinematographers out there that do, do not do photography that often. And I guess because, you know, when you're working as a cinematographer, you're working hours upon hours upon hours doing that. And then maybe they just get, they just want to change their pace and do something else. For me, my photography is extremely personal to me for the main reason is this. It's me against me. It's just me. The strap, the camera, whatever is around my, my shoulder, my neck, and it's just me. My eyes, my heart, my perspective, my narrative, no one behind me, no producers or crew or anybody looking at the monitors that I'm shooting with the, behind the DIT village and telling me, make it warmer, make it cooler. Can you do this? Can you do that? And you look over your shoulder, there's 200 people you know, executing your vision. It's a tremendously collaborative medium. Tremendously so. Not one person could take full credit to anything because it's a collective uh, you know, camaraderie of our hearts collectively as a whole for a single vision when you're on a project. No one can take full responsibility of a project. There are many, many people involved. But when I do my photography, it's just me. It's a single voice. And sometimes I can get off on taking one photograph that I get stimulated about and inspired about than I do on a multi-million dollar project sometimes because I know it's purely me. So my photography is very, very important. Uh, you know, I have a lot of greats. Uh, you know, Irving Penn, Joel Peter Whitkin. Uh, there's so many, many great photographers that I study, that I look at. That's part of my homework that we all do as cinematographers. Uh, we have to get knowledge as to who's out there, who's doing what, and have a history of the background, the history of these photographers and the forefront runners of these photographers, the grandfathers of these particular mediums that we do. You know, the young generation, I mean, God bless them, I, I consider them to be young whippersnappers, but they're, they're, they're very myopic. They just look at the present sometimes, and they don't look at the past. You got to go to the roots. You know, instead of going to a museum and to feel and to explore and to see a brushstroke of a Caravaggio or a Van Gogh, you know, to see the textures of those brushstrokes. So look at a Rembrandt painting and know what that 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 uh, that expression is, Rembrandt lighting. What is that? Young filmmakers don't know anything about that. They get on their iPhones, they take a virtual tour of, of a museum, and they think they did a tour. But yeah. you have to get back to the roots. Same with photography. You have to know what an F-stop is, what a T-stop is, what an iris does in a camera. What's the difference between a 16 in the iris of a lens versus a 1.4? What does that mean to a photographer? This is old school properties that we must adhere to and know and, and educate ourselves with. And I find that very frustrating, especially this day and age, you know, with the advent of new cameras and technologies and 2K, 4K, 6K, 8K, you know, everyone is getting so involved in that, uh, which is very, very important because cinematography is not just an art, it's also a craft and science. We must know all of this. To me, the most important thing is not necessarily the camera per se, it's the glass that I put in front of the camera, the lenses, you know, whether it's an Airy Alexa or whether it's a Sony Venice, whether it's a Panavision film camera, whether it's an Aeroflex film camera. The cameras to me is just a transport or to record. Uh, you have to know all those color spaces and the technical uh, things that are involved in menus. But to me, the most important thing of, of cinematography is not so much that. The young generation gets really caught up in that, but it's about camera placement, camera movement, color, lighting, 
People think, oh, you know, we working with 6,400 ASA now cameras. We don't need to light. You don't need to light anymore. Right. I get I, I get shivers when I hear that. You may have an exposure now when you go outside at night. You have an exposure, but you're not lit. You know, right. to me, when they say that, that's ignorance. You have to now light for ratios. You know, your highlights, you don't want them to bloom and to lose detail. Your shadows, you want to lift up so you can feel the textures of black. Black is not just black. Black has texture to it. And when you've got two different spectrums between highlight and shadow, yes, you want to light so it comes a little closer to reach into the details of shadows, to reach into the highlights of, 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 the, of the highlights. You need to light that to manipulate your ratios. You're not lit just because you're working at 6,400 ISO. You know, so when people said, we don't need to light anymore, horseshit. You need yeah. to light, you need to sculpt, you need to shape. You know, you may have exposure, like I said, because of these high ISO cameras and sophisticated cameras, but you still need the heart, the spirit, the mind, the creative zeal to understand lighting. If I'm looking at you and like, I, I love putting a back edge on the subjects that are talking, that are, uh, are expressing themselves. Because what a back edge of light to me does, it chisels them out from the background. Me personally, when I don't put an edge, they kind of blend in to the background. Personally, I don't like that because when you're looking at a screen, it's two dimensional. It's two dimensional. But when you light and you create edges, whatever, all of a sudden it does this. It comes out at you. There's that third dimension. So that's lighting. I love putting a little line of light on the dark fill side of the face when I'm key lighting on this side, just to put that line of light to chisel, to separate this edge, this jaw from the background. It's things like that. Maybe sometimes I do want the face to blend in to a dark background and be ominous if someone is coming out of an alleyway or what have you. Of course. But there it again goes, you have to know how to light, how to tell your story, what the story is about. Um, you know, if I'm lighting a, a woman, um, you know, naturally I would bring my light a little lower perhaps. Maybe I would not bring in so much to the side, but come around just a little in the front, just a bit more than normal, just to get into the eyes, to shape the face a little more beautifully. Maybe put a piece of extra diffusion on front of the light, just to soften the shadows a bit. You have to know how to light. So when you tell a story, you have to know what the story is about emotionally, whether it's drama, uh, whether it's haunt, whether it's comedy, uh, whether you, you want to evoke it, but not foreshadow something that's coming around the corner. You have to know your story. What is propelling the buttons of the story in the heart? And as a cinematographer, that's our job is to know how to tell this story visually. You know, I do an exercise when I travel. I travel a lot because of my occupation. I'm constantly perpetually on, on airplanes. And, you know, you always have these monitors in front of you in the back of the seat in front of you. And people are watching movies. You're watching a movie. You put it on to entertain yourself for five hours, whatever it may be. But I never watch a film with the sound ever. Mm -hmm. I just watch it just for the visual aspect of it because I want to know what the story is about just by looking at the visual captures, looking at the visual roller coaster, how the cinematographer, the director, the filmmakers are telling the story visually. I want to feel the story. I want to hear the words by looking at the visuals. And it's an exercise I use all the time. You know, and, and another exercise I use, you know, to keep my, my imagination sharp and my synapses constantly firing is music. I listen to a lot of music, as we all do, but I listen to soundtracks. Mm -hmm. Very, very rarely I listen to music with lyrics. Of course, I, I have my favorites, you know, my favorite bands, of course. But when I'm in my own state of mind and I'm kind of meditative, my heart is pumping creatively and I just want to wander. It's my own personal meditation. I will listen to soundtracks of just music. And when I hear the music, it forces me to think and come up with and create visuals in my head. And when I first started out as a, as a cinematographer, my background was music videos. 
you know, after I was doing commercials and in music videos back then in the day, it was a, a glorious time because we were inventing, we were exploring, uh, we weren't nervous about making mistakes. We didn't have the account executives or producers or networks or studios on your back. God forbid you made a mistake. We were pioneers. We would explore and just balls to the walls, uh, invent. And when you're doing a music video, when you listen to a song, you know, a director at that time, you know, still does, would write a concept from what they hear and feel from the song. And you would use your visual creative imagination to tell that story in a music video way. And that was my background. So music is so, so very, very important to me. And I use that often when I look at things. You know, right now, my time off, you know, I'm, I'm trying to put together another book of my images. And it's interesting. I've been doing a creative exercise for myself uh, because instead of sitting on my ass all day, I would post my some of my photography on stories on Instagram mm -hmm. Avenue. And because it's on stories, I'm able to put music to it. You so can do that in a post now, too. Yes, you can. Yes. And I love that. Because it's an interesting exercise, and, and I really strongly advise people to do this because it really it really gets inside your, your creative heart to get out of that shell, to explore, and to feel different emotions when you look at an image. But you put one image on, and then it's your job to think about, okay, what kind of music would I want for this particular uh, image? What am I hearing in my head when I see this particular image? And it's a great exercise. And then you you choose your music, and the music plays to the image. And then all of a sudden, that image takes a totally different perspective. It takes on a life that's very, very different unto its own. And you start to smile, and it gives it a little more extra emotional flair. And I just love that about music. You know, a lot of people ask me in interviews, Crescenzo, you know, if you were not a cinematographer... What else would you be doing? What would you want to do? And I always answer that uh, very succinctly because I've always wanted to be a musical composer. Mm. You know, when I was a baby, when I was small, you know, I was studying piano when I, my mom was a, you know, a Bernstein fan and Elmer Bernstein and we had pianos in the house and I was playing a lot of piano, classical piano. And I always had that affinity, that love for, for the music aspect. And when I was in college, there was one course, you know, musical recording. I super loved that that direction that I was I was maybe going into, uh, because I love when you have an image, and then you start scoring music to these images. Uh, it just gives me the the chills. I just love it. Uh, and there was a few times where I had the privilege and the honor and the blessing, where I would work on a project and a director would invite me in the post world in the studio where you have these composers, these orchestras, you know, looking at the time code of your film that you just shot and they're scoring music to it. And I would just get chills. I would just love that aspect of music. So music and film to me is a fantastic marriage. You know, that's uh, something, it does sound like you and I are very similar. You know, I, I would say maybe I was more interested in Victor Borg, <laughs> than, uh, <laughs> but, um, but uh, you know, the, I've, I've tried to articulate a few times on this podcast how like uh, being a musician, I'm a drummer and I've played guitar, but being a musician and being a cinematographer are very similar. And something I've heard you mention yes. in a handful of pod uh, uh, interviews is uh, sort of uh, lighting or, or, or create crafting the image from the heart. And earlier you had mentioned how, uh, you know, these days uh, younger filmmakers tend to get a little stuck in the um technology of it all and i think it's kind of easy to forget or not uh, value the past as much because new stuff is coming out every time and it feels like you're just kind of playing whack-a-mole trying to learn everything not yes. realizing that there's a large uh volume of stuff that will never change that you <laughs> can go and learn but i was wondering if you could sort of potentially articulate um how to rise out obviously um just going out and shooting a lot is going to uh, give you sort of the confidence, you know, enough failures will give you the confidence to not think about the tech so much, but in your own way, how, how would you articulate, um, not only how to, 
get unstuck out of that gear mode, but also um, how to marry that history and maybe mentors with your own vibe and your own flavor. Very simply, you got to surround yourself with that support group. Your friends, your peers, your artists, your directors, your cinematographers, your production designers, your editors, your visual effects gurus. You got to surround yourself with people like these, socialize with them, hang with them, have conversations with them, go behind the scenes, see what they're doing, look what they're doing, ask questions, digest what they're doing, and then you grab this, you grab this, you put it in your head, you put it in your heart, and it becomes part of your subconscious library. You know, a lot of times I look at photography books. I'm a, I'm a freak with photography books. I have thousands of photography books in my house. And before I start a project, I will look at my shelves of stacked with books and I will look at the titles and say, okay, and I will pull the spine out just like an inch out. Well, this may be good for this project. This may be good for this project. This may be good for this project. And then a day goes by and says, okay, I'll push one in, but maybe push one a little further out. And then by a couple of days later, I would have maybe about 20 books out. I will take all 20 books out, stack them up on my desk, and I will just flip through them just to see these images, get it in my head, get it in my subconscious library. I want to open up my drawer in my mind and feed myself. I want to feed myself with these images, not only with still photography, but also with films. You know, you go on to IMDb, you go on to iTunes, you know, you go on to your, your DVDs, uh, you go on to your TCMs, you know, and you make a list of what's going to inspire you and you watch these films, you look at these photographs, you collectively put it in your subconscious, and then you try to get inspired. And before I do a, a project, you know, I come up with a lookbook. You know, I'll, I'll go to Kinko's, I'll get all my photography books, you know, underneath my shoulder. I'll maybe print out maybe 100 images. I'll bind it, put it in a binder, hard covered, and I'll just keep it for myself. So in between uh, episodes, in between days, in between on weekends, whatever, you know, sometimes I'll just flip through it just to remind myself, just to fire a synapse in my head. I may not be conscious of it, but it's going through my eyes and in my head and it's going somewhere in my creative heart. And that's important to me. So to answer your question, you know, to get out there and these young filmmakers, you know, technology is very, very important. Yes. There's a lot of technology now. I just came from Cinegear this past weekend. Oh, my oh, God. I, I was there, too. It was a bombardment of equipment. Yeah, yeah. Very, very important. Uh, but as, a, as an a artist. A lot of displays. <laughs> <laughs> you that's displays. another statement. Yes. Yeah. Displays. That's a good way of saying it. But now, you know, it's your job to take these displays, to take this information and to not get so bogged down with the technology aspect. And I'm old school. So I say this very positively uh, because I'm old school. You have to know the basics. You have to put the technology aside for a second. And you have to really try to rise above that ring of circle there of the creative aspect, not so much of the science technical aspect, but the creative arts aspect. And where does that come from? It comes from your aesthetics. Your aesthetics change from day to day. Uh, I, I truly feel you can grow your aesthetics. Just what I just finished saying to you about photography, watching films, having conversations, your aesthetics will evolve each day when you're in tune, taking pictures every single day, then all of a sudden you're taking photographs every single day. And when you're taking photographs every single day, and I'm very privileged to say this, very honored and blessed to say this, I don't want to come across corny by saying this. But when you're an artist, especially as a photographer, painter, sculptor, what have you, you are seeing things differently than the normal person. Things are a little more magnified that a normal person would never, ever see. And to me, that's a beautiful thing to live your way of life, is to see things that are so magnified but so small in detail but you as an artist, because your sensitivity and your creative aspect of your DNA is heightened 
and and growing, those little details that we see that perpetually go over our heads every day are now in front of our heads and faces and eyes in a big, magnificent way. And it's our job now to structure that in, in, a, in a composition, in a graphic, in, in a placement of a photograph, in an expression of a painting, uh, of, of a sculpture, whatever it may be. And I think that's a beautiful thing that artists have. And it's so important to keep that sharp. You know, so again, getting back to our first initial discussion, you know, downtime. You know, a lot of times when you're in a downtime, you atrophy. Your imagination mm -hmm. starts to atrophy a bit. Your synapses are not firing as much. You know, I'm at my strongest when I'm at my busiest. It's yeah. very interesting process, you know. And I can atrophy, technically speaking, you know, when I'm sitting on my ass for a couple of months now because of the strike, technically I may atrophy. Creatively, I can atrophy because I'm not on the set, but that's my photography now. So I try to keep my creative aspect as high as I can all the time, even during my downtime. Granted, when I get onto the set, I'm a little daunted technically. You know, I got to educate myself. I got to constantly read my brochures and go through my notes, speak to my crew, speak to my my gaffer, my key grip, my chief ca um, camera assistant, you know, make my tests, go to Panavision, wherever it may go, and, and to get myself abreast now of the technology and the sharp of my senses again. And then from there, I can choose what technology I want. You know, you know, you got 10 brands of lenses. Why does one go with this brand versus this brand? You know, you have to know those nuances and what these lenses and glass and optics are expressing. Is that what you want to tell your story with? So it's a very interesting thing that we as uh, directors of photographers, cinematographers go through that a lot of people are unaware of. Uh, well, it's, it's a beautiful job. It's a beautiful occupation. Yeah. And I was going to say that going back to what you're saying a little earlier, choosing those lenses, because I think someone listening would be uh, who's, you know, maybe younger, you know, more inexperienced would be like, well, how do you know what those lenses uh, show? And the answer is history. You know, anamorphic lenses only give us that feeling because of, let's say, Spielberg, you know, setting the tone like that. Now that's what an anamorphic is. That's correct. Um, the, the previous uh, masters, the previous uh artists kind of inform and then maybe you get to not you specifically but you know you as a person get to uh decide what the next technology is you know there's that um uh that guy who was like flying drones all over the place and for a while everyone was like this is the thing and then it ended up in ambulance it's not the <laughs> same guy but that style of you know yes. first person yeah, you know like new technology ambulance. yeah you get to set the tone but you were you had mentioned uh, you know, making lookbooks and stuff and kind of pivoting into Picard a little bit. Um, you did season two and three of Picard, right? That's correct. And prior to that, I was up in Toronto doing Star Trek Discovery. Right. That's another fun one. Um, I, I very much, like I said, or off camera, like very much enjoyed Picard season three. Obviously, everyone's over the moon over, uh, but I enjoyed all three seasons. Um, but the look of season two versus season three, obviously, pandemic aside, very different locations, very different. But I was wondering uh, what those sort of uh, lookbooks or, or 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 lighting inspirations were between those two seasons. Yes. And then specifically this season, which is so much more uh, dramatic, you know, as John was saying in our other interview, you know, this, the, the bridges are dark. Everything is inc incredibly dark, whereas yes. season two basically takes place outside. Yes. Well, there there alone was the big difference. Uh, was the 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 uh, the concepts, the stories? What season was the difference between each season? Season two was more on location, more in Los Angeles, which is very unorthodox in my opinion for Star Trek yeah. to be on location in Los Angeles. They should be in San Francisco. <laughs> Whereas season three was more inside the spaceships, more more in the canon of the Star Trek world. So season two was very different, not only because we started season two with the very start of the pandemic. It was very interesting. Pandemic started March. We started March. We were wearing masks and face shields, and it was very difficult that in itself to work. But now we're on locations, wearing all this paraphernalia on your face, 
trying to light people, trying to light your actors when you every, all your standards are wearing these masks and face shields. Very, very different. And we are exterior, mostly season two. Season three, mostly in our ships. Stargazer, the Titan, the Shrike. Uh, it was a love letter, you know, to the fan base, uh, season three. I think Terry Metalis did a very great job uh, giving the fan base what they wanted. It was a love letter, season three. Uh, therefore, we wanted to make the spaceships a little darker. Season two, we were in Stargazer. Uh, that was canon, meaning that's the way it was lit. It was a little okay. brighter. Uh, it was a little more pleasant. Uh, season three, things were getting a little more darker regarding story. And, you know, in my particular episodes, you know, I did a, a beautiful episode, 307, uh, called Dominion. Uh, directed by Deborah Kapmeyer, uh, you know, with Amanda Plummer. Amanda Plummer playing uh, the character Vadik uh, with her ship Shrike. And in that particular episode, it was a cat and mouse uh, happening between Vadik's ship, Amanda Plummer's ship Shrike, you know, with the Titan, with the, the Star Trek uh, cast. Yeah. And it was a cat and mouse. So I had the luxury, I had the blessing to be a little more out of the box uh, with that particular episode in terms of lighting. You know, I had shafts of light coming through the windows, flarings of light, kinetic energy of light, flickering, pulsing, chasing, color changes. I had all of that during this episode. And one would step back in the minds and say, how does that work in outer space? What does that mean? What is the reality of that? But it was creative license because of this cat and mouse chase. You know, one side of the moon, are we, I mean, on one side of the ship, is there sun coming in? And if there's sun coming in those sides of the windows, it, it will allow me to be a little more harder with the shafts of light, the beams of light to come through the ship. If one side is moon and other planets, maybe I want to be cooler and softer with the lights. You know, you have to pay attention to the story and to the visual effects. You know, are there nebulas? outside the windows. You know, you have a giant view screen in front of the ship where all the cadets and commanders are sitting in their st sitting in the chairs, looking outside the windows, and there's space, giant space outside the window right in front of you. Are there nebulas out there? What is a nebula? Do your research. What is the colors of the nebulas? What are the movements of the nebulas? What are we doing visual effect-wise with the nebulas? It is my job to marry that kinetic energy and lighting and color scheme through those windows by way of my lighting. So I would have this very visceral uh, shapes of light, colors of lights. Uh, my programmer, Josh Thatcher, my gaffer, Len Levine, they were extraordinary, executing right on the fly, right on the spot, the choreography that we would come up with on the fly as we would block and rehearse and express what this is about, and then all of a sudden start executing this. And we would have over a thousand lights in our dimmer board, and to Jeez. execute each light in a different way, in different colors, different chasing, different pulsing, is quite extraordinary when you're trying to choreograph maybe a two-second moment. You know, maybe it's an explosion outside the window, et cetera. So it, it was a very fascinating process. A tremendous difference between season two and season three, mainly because of the scripts. Scripts on season two was basically L.A., exterior day, a lot of locations. Pandemic didn't help us. It was very arduous, very difficult to find that stride because of pandemic. No excuses, but it was a different beast. Sure. Season three, Terry made a love letter to the fan base. We were in our spaceships. Our spaceships were our characters. Um, yes, it was much darker because we wanted to be much more dramatic at times, not all of the times, but mostly we wanted to be more dramatic. Uh, what does that mean? Does it mean going darker? Perhaps it does. Uh, does it mean changing your colors sometimes? Perhaps it does. Uh, does it mean changing your camera angles lower in between things, you know, behind things? Yes, it does. A uh, combination of all of the above. But we still have to maintain the canon aspect of these ships. You know, the audience wants to see the detail of the ships. You know, we spend months and months and months having conversations, storyboards, pre-viz, uh, pre 
renderings. And then we get to the set, we build the sets, we build the, the spaceships. You know, it doesn't come in in a week. You know, there are months of planning, months of lighting. There's a lot of embedded lighting within these ships. So we are prepared to do whatever we need to do based on that particular script. In my personal humble opinion, you want it to be dark, but I don't take that literally too much all of the time. I just don't make it dark or expose it to be dark because I still want to see the information. You right. couldn't allure emotionally what darkness is. Darkness doesn't mean just the absence of light. Darkness can sometimes mean your compositions, you know, putting something in a foreground to allure uh, a haunt of some sort. So there's a lot of things that register in the subconscious mind the word dark. Yes, okay, exposure, lighting. We will. We were making things much darker, yes. I was making things a little more brighter than my colleague because I wanted to see the textures of the darkness. Right. I did not want the backgrounds to go pure black and to lose those layers of depth where production designer and his art department work so hard in the detail of all the textures, of all the layers of the darkness. So it's my job to light it in a way with my ratios to feel that it's dark, to feel that it's haunting and brooding, but to find that level of expertise just enough to feel the textures of that darkness. But yes, that's what season three was about. You know, we had very dark characters. There, there was a lot of things going on with the Shrike, with Amanda Plummer's character, Vadik. You know, it was a very interesting season, uh, creatively speaking. I think the scriptwriters uh, did a terrific job, you know, with the arcs of, uh, of what was going on in a very dark, uh, mysterious, dramatic way. Again, that was the difference between two and three, apples and oranges. You cannot compare. It was just the structure and how it was written for two, how it was written for three, and then we start to execute it, and there's your result. Yeah. Now, when you mention, uh, you know, having thousands of lights, I imagine most of those uh, were embedded within the set. Um, yes. Could you could you kind of talk to me a little bit about uh, your relationship with the production designer on the season? Because you know, like like you were saying with Vatic ship, I mean that thing feels like an iron forge. And then, uh, you know, the the sort of um, uh, what do you call it? The Federation ships tend to have a lot more gloss, a lot more uh, polish yes. and, and fanciness to them. But how were uh, not only you know did you have input on where? obviously film lights go, but did you have input with the production designers on where the rest of these things went or were you kind of given a palette to work with? No, I had tremendous input. Mm. A director of photography has tremendous input like this with the production designer in the prep process, in the pre-process, in the design process. There is a tremendous direct marriage between the production designer and the director photographer uh, within the design and all of the embedded lighting. We come up this together. Obviously, you get ideas, you get blueprints, you get previs, you get renderings from the production designer. You look at it, you digest it, you come up with ideas, you go to his office, he comes to your office, you talk, you communicate. What about this? What about that? You know what, if the if the cast is going to walk through this tunnel often and I want to be cinema verite and, and just have the cameras roll and just follow them and lead them into one quarter to the next, I need to have embedded lighting within the set to light these faces. You know, then you come up with facets of light on the top corners, you know, 45 degree angles of lights so it catches in their eyes. You want bottom angles of lights on the floor, 45 degrees angles up you know, to create some ominous angles of light. And then you can control the top and the bottom by way of the dimmer board as to how you want to evoke that feeling. Is it a beautiful, clean, glossy feel with a cadet or a captain walking down a corridor? Or is it a very ominous feel where there's, they're about to embark in, in war, in, in chaos, and in explosions of, of artillery going back and forth? And you want this ominous uh, feeling of light from the bottom. But you have to design it within the set. Because as you see, when you look at the sets, there's a lot of cast. There's a lot of people left, right, forward, 
background, walking around, cinema verite. I love moving the cameras. I love swishing the cameras from left to right. You know, I work with Jonathan Frakes, the godfather of Star Trek. He directed my blocks, and he has an expression which I love, you know, when we swish and pan going from one character to the next when they're talking. He says, just follow the puck. Mm. And to follow the puck is not easy in terms of lighting. You know, you swish pan to this person over there doing one thing. You swish pan to that person over there doing another thing. And you want to make sure they're lit. You know, after all, we're not photoshopping. We're not doing photographs. This is cinema. So you want to be clever where the lights are coming from and how they're moving to get into the crevices of the eyes to make sure they're looking good. This is our cast. This is what we do. Our job is to make them look as best as we can in whatever areas, whatever dynamics they're doing on the set. I love doing 360s on a set. You look at my episodes, I love moving the camera, all right? Therefore, when you're doing 360s, you cannot have film lights in the set because you've got to look at them. So Off therefore, floor. you have to be clever enough to know this beforehand in the prep process to know that you're going to rely on the embedded lighting of the design of the set with you and the production the production designer david blatz in this particular instance and then there's a marriage you know so yes we would design it together it's very very important i learned this lesson when i first got on to star trek discovery mm -hmm. up in toronto and it was a beautiful thing that i've never encountered but it was a very beautiful thing to see that once a week before call time all of the department heads including the department riggers, every department would come to the art department on their big round conference table. And we would have all the blueprints out. And we collectively would be around in a circle on every single department, looking at the blueprints, talking about the set, talking about the design, talking about the execution of the design, talking about the materials of the design, every department, the colors, the ribbing, the textiles, whether you want bicolor, you know, all the colors, do you want to chase the colors? Do we need this? And it was a beautiful thing to spend like a half hour of time to talk about the design of the sets. And it was a beautiful thing. When I came to Picard, obviously because of the pandemic, we couldn't do that. I love being tactile. When you're looking at a blueprint, you know, you're with someone directly to speak and to point and to touch and to feel. We could not do that during season two with the pandemic. It was very frustrating because we had to communicate a tremendous amount of detail by way of Zooming. Right. And you have to wait until one person finishes. Then it's your turn to sneak yourself in there with the Zoom. When you're looking at all the thumbnails on top, there's like 40 people trying to get a word. And it's all by way of Zooming. And then you get this delay, and it's very frustrating. Uh, but this is how we had to execute it. You know? And then after that, then yes, it was my responsibility and uh, production design's responsibility, my gaffer's responsibility, my rigging gaffer, my rigging grip, my key grip, all of us. It was our responsibility now collectively to see how we could sneak in a direct meeting within ourselves, you know, maintaining the rules of COVID. You know, it was very difficult, but we had to maintain those rules. At that time, it was crazy. You had to be six feet apart from each other. Even though you were wearing all these face masks and shields, you had to be six feet apart at that time. It was nuts. Uh, but that's your job now to communicate the detail and the design of our sets. And our designs were so intricate these spaceships are so intricate, you know, from the Stargazer in two, from the Titan in three, from the Shrike ship, you know, with Amanda Plummer's uh, ship, you know, these ships were detailed and it doesn't come overnight. There's a lot of conversation. There's a lot of pre-viz storyboards, renderings going back and forth, um, collectively with our hearts, discussing this, discussing that. And then it's an amazing process that when you get to the set, and the very ground floor foundation aspect, and you see it being built. And I know they had time lapse of this. I cannot wait to see the time lapse of these sets being built and constructed and lit. You know, a director or photographer, like I said from the beginning, Kenny, is, is a very, very important part to the production designer as to how to light these sets. 
you know, he's asking me, where do you want the light, Crescenzo? What's important to you? Where is it coming from? You know, mm -hmm. let's design it. You know, then we got to think about how do we design into this spaceship with its proper concept and its proper, you know, mechanics of you. I can't just design a beautiful, you know, artistic light into the set that has no meaning of a spaceship. So now he has giant to, white he, wall. He, exactly. So <laughs> he has to take that design and figure out in, in context of a spaceship how to execute what the director of photographer wants, you know, and not only design it, you know, in a creative aspect, where I want, where I want the light to come from and the facets, but the colors of it and how I want to apply the colors, how I want to chase the colors, to pulse the light, to flicker the light, to flutter the light. Do I want explosions of lightning? You know, these are all things now you got to program specifically in the specific lights that are now going into the embedded lighting of the ship. You know, you put these sky panel lights up into these big source of these milk glass windows on top of the spaceship. Okay, the production designer asks you, how much light is that emitting? What kind of diffusion do we want to put in front of the uh, the sky panel lights? You know, milk glass, white milk glass, thick milk glass, or is it quasi, you know, transparent? You know, what is the distance behind the light that you need, you know, for cabling, for rigging? You know, there's a lot of rigging involved when you put up a light embedded into the sets. You know, you're looking at these small little details of armrests, of banisters, railings in the in the spaceship you know in the corridors in the transporting rooms in the floors you know there's a lot of little details of leds and you don't just turn it on and off do we want the leds to flicker to to flutter to pulse to on and off you know is it a a a, a, a red alert is it a black alert you know we got to be prepared for all of that then you get these geniuses on the benches, in their minds, in their in their drawing boards, coming up with all these ways how to execute these lights onto the set. Naturally, the audience hasn't a clue as to what's involved. They're just looking at a finished product in all its glory, executed in a beautiful way, and being involved in a story. But when you pull the camera back and get outside the set or boom the camera up into the grids, above right. the ceilings of the set, you would be amazed on the piping, on the catwalks, on the structuring, on the amounts of cabling that's involved, all coming into a, a, a board of where a programmer has every light at his disposal, controlling it in detail. And it's just a fascinating process, very detailed. So to reiterate, to answer your question at the beginning, yes, a director of photographer is very much involved with the production designer in lighting of these sets. And I get a little upset, you know, when people look at a, a visual effects show and they say, well, you know, there's a lot of visual effects. It's not that much cinematography, you know, we're just going to bypass, you know, the nods for cinematography, you know, because there's a lot of visual effects. Right. And I find that ignorant. I get very upset hearing that because the ignorance is you have no idea what the conversations are in the prep stage with visual effects in order to execute that of what I do cinematographically, lighting-wise. Like, for instance, our guru, Jason Zimmerman, who was a visual effects supervisor, you know, we would have these often conversations. Who's taking the lead? Does he have the material and the source material and the concepts first, visual effect-wise? And if so, I need to know that because I need to now mark my script in detail where those visual effects are coming in at what time of the day, what planets, what nebulas, through the windows. Um, and I have to now execute that and mimic that lighting. You know, if there's a red nebula outside of the window, I got to make sure I'm prepared in my lighting, in my pre-lighting, my pre-rigging with my crew to make sure I have that red light ready and available on the dimmer to go red. Do I want yeah. that red light to pulse? Do I want that red light to flash, to explode? Is there an explosion out there? I have to read the script. I have to mark the script in detail. You know, is there is the nebula swirling with different colors of light? You know, now I got to think about all the lights that I need out there with all the color scheme that we have to choreograph, program it into the board. People don't understand 
We need to program every light, every mechanics, every movement, every shape of light into the board, and we have to program it. We have to especially with LEDs it. now. Yes, exactly. So it becomes very involved, and uh, it's very daunting at times. You know, I, I never forget. I, I made a mistake once. It was on Discovery, and I learned a big lesson. You know, between uh, not to regress, but getting into uh, anamorphic lenses versus spherical lenses. Sure, and we're an anamorphic show. And with anamorphic, not to be too detailed, but for those who know this, you know, you have a-, a This very, is the podcast it, for detail. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. You know, it, in the beat, the backgrounds that are out of focus, uh, the depth of field, when you have a shallow depth of field, when the lenses are wide open and you have a shallow depth of field, the background becomes out of focus. It becomes oppressionistic. It becomes soft. And if you have lights in that background, we call what we see from those lights bokeh. And when the bokeh starts to bloom from a shallow depth of field, it takes on a beautiful presence, a very impressionistic presence. So here I am shooting a, a, a close-up, a beautiful close-up of Saru, uh -huh. in Star Trek Discovery. He's leaning up against the window, Mr. Looking, Jones. Out, looking out into space. And, you know, you have to know what you're having outside in space, not only visual effect-wise, but am I going green screen? Am I going blue screen? Why do I want to go green screen? Why do I want to go blue screen? You know, it depends on the wardrobe, of course. Um, is it a, a projection? Is it a rear screen projection? Uh, is it a backdrop with a star field, you know, just to save money? Or is it just a, a, a smoke, be hazy, and have a beam of light coming through there? You know, in this particular case, you know, because of monies, we couldn't afford the uh, the visual effects at this particular stage because we were spending a lot of money. So we were trying to cut corners. It was one shot. So we didn't want to go green screen because then there's an element and all of that involved with visual effects. So we said, you know what, just put a star field out there and have these little twinkly stars in, in the background out of focus. Here I am concentrating on Saru's face in the corridor and I lit it really beautifully. It chose a, my, my beautiful portrait lens. Really happy with it. Camera comes around to an over the shoulder of what he's looking at. I'm now behind him, looking out into the window. Cut, press on. And I look at my dailies the next day. And uh, no kidding, I almost fell off my chair. <laughs> I had a huge gulp because those stars, those little stars that I had outside the window, were blooming like footballs. Right, because of the anamorphic. Because of anamorphic lenses. They were blooming very elongatedly. And it looked surreal. It did look like planets. Planets are round, spherical, stars when they're out of focus and, you know, the lumin luminescence of light, you know, they're glowing in a round way, round sparkles. These were very oblong shapes of light. And, oh, my God, what did I do? You know, so it's things like that, you know, as a cinematographer, you have to know, you know, what's going out there. If it's going to be, you know, in camera, like in that particular situation with a star field, you know, what do I do? I want those stars to remain round. I either go with a, 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 a bigger depth of field, not be wide open, but light it more so I can close my iris down to maybe a five, six, or maybe even an eight at that particular shot just to keep those round circles more rounder and not so out of focus in an elongated uh, anamorphic way. Or uh, is there more than one shot within this particular day? You know, then I got to go to the production manager and a producer and say, you know, I like to order a set of spherical lenses for this particular day. You know, they'll ask you why, blah, blah, blah. You go through the script, you mark it down, you wait it out, pros and cons. You know, you do your best you can. This is what we do in the prep stage is to know all those little details. So it's a very interesting process indeed. Yeah. Well, and when you were talking about the ignorance of uh, people saying, oh, it's a VFX heavy show in the cinematography, like uh, the flip side of that, that I've said a bunch on this podcast is that a lot of times cinematographers and maybe sometimes we'll just kind of be quiet and go, yeah, uh, we'll get credit. <laughs> for what the production designer has done, you know, uh, the, you know, oh, the colors are so beautiful and, and the lighting and you're like, yeah, that colors was the production designer. I didn't, <laughs> you don't set the color, maybe the colorist did, but usually it's like the set, but, um, 
I did want to ask, you had mentioned uh, Jonathan Frakes as a director and, and his body of work kind of speaks for itself, but yes. uh, I've heard a lot that he's just a fantastic, uh, you know, uh, team captain. And I was wondering if there was anything that you learned from him uh, during your time shooting uh, probably both seasons of Picard that um, yes. maybe you, you're going to carry with you uh, to the next gigs. Well, absolutely. Uh, first of all, uh, I love Jonathan Frakes uh, like a brother. As the expression goes, you know, a brother from another mother. Yeah. Uh, he and I are very, very close. We did a lot of work together. I, I, I've heard a coined phrase recently, which I raised my hand to because it's so true. You know, he's like the godfather of Star Trek right now. Yeah. So true. Uh, season, uh, season three, you know, his block, two episodes. Uh, fortunately, it was me who shot those for him, and we were side by side once again. Uh, all my work on Discovery uh, was with him as well. And my introduction to Discovery, uh, Star Trek Discovery up in Toronto, was fortunately with him. I was just coming off a show uh, in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, called Gotham. Totally yeah. different show. Totally. Um, so I went from Gotham to do Star Trek. And how I got the show Star Trek. A little different. <laughs> a little different, yes. Uh, but how I got that show, to be honest with you, not to regress a bit, and I'll get back to Jonathan Frakes, was a director I worked with on on uh, Gotham, uh, a director by the name of Olatunde. Olatunde. And if I could pronounce his last name correct, it's Asun Samni. Mm -hmm. uh, but he went on to do Star Trek Discovery after Gotham as a director-producer. Mm -hmm. And he called me to be part of that. And I was so happy that he called me, but I was still on Gotham. I wanted to respect my time with Gotham. That's just me being professional, maintaining professional protocol. So I stayed with Gotham. I didn't want to leave, leave the ship and then go up to do another show. That's just not right. In my opinion, I feel strong about that. Season one, season two, he kept calling me every single season. And it came to season three and I just finished Gotham. I finally raised my hand. I said, yes. And it was a beautiful thing. So before I knew it, I was up there in Toronto on a new show, Star Trek Discovery. But my introduction to the show was with Jonathan Frakes. That was his his episode. I happened to be the one up to shoot his episode. Of course, I'm nervous. I'm, uh, you know, my mouth is dry. I'm panicking. I'm working with everyone as geniuses up there with Star Trek, you know, true geniuses. My well, I imagine you're a Next Generation fan yourself. Me? Yeah. Well, I've watched it. I wouldn't say I was like a complete nerd of Star Trek. I, uh, you, me neither. The, it's hard to say fan with Star Trek, but I know what you mean. <laughs> so I wasn't one of those, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't one of those. Yes, I've watched shows. I've had the knowledge, but I wasn't one of those. And I was working with people that they were all one of those. They were all oh. geniuses. They were walking libraries of factoids of Star Trek, every single one of them. So I was nervous. Uh, but Jonathan, we had a conversation, and pardon the expression, he took me into his creative bosom and, and nurtured me, and we had a great time. Uh, he really made sure I maintained my heart as an artist mm -hmm. and not get so bogged down about the mythologies and the methodologies and the canon of Star Trek. Let's just you and I discuss creatively what this scene is about. What do we want to evoke dramatically? And let's just talk in terms of that. And he took all that nervousness I had about the Star Trek canon, and we just talked about what the scene should be about emotionally. And obviously I was hired for a reason, as we all are, you know, for us to do what we need to do in our hearts, uh, to put our own thumbprints in and creative impulses on it. Obviously, I didn't want to stray too far away because of the Grand Poobah himself, you know, the Wizard of Oz, uh, Mr. Alex Kurtzman, you know, who's in charge of all of the legacy of Star Trek. He has a certain way of doing certain things, and he's very precise in his looks. Uh, that's underneath his umbrella. Mm. And you have to respect that and maintain that. Uh, but when you're hired as an individual cinematographer coming in, that's a different cinematographer from the other cinematographers. Yes, you want to make sure you stay within those parameters because those are successful parameters. 
the show is going on to the next season for a reason because this show is successful. And you don't want to stray too much about that and start raising eyebrows. But each one of us has different thumbprints, different aesthetics. And you want to raise it just a bit. You want to hit those buttons just a bit. You want to give it your personal heart, your personal stamp in your way that you can within all of that in a seamless, beautiful way. So it's a delicate dance when you come onto a show that is already existing. At that time, you know, my partner was Glenn Keenan. He was fantastic. Uh, we spoke a lot. He nurtured me a lot. We spoke uh, about our personal methods. You know, my methods sometimes are very different than his and vice versa. I would get nervous. Am I going too far? He would say, no, just go for it. Just do it and, and comfort me. Uh, but getting back to Jonathan Frakes, uh, he was one of those guys, you know, that's a crew guy. Uh, and I mean that with such admiration and affection. There's a lot of directors that don't even know the names of the crew. Sometimes, you know, don't even know the name of me at the end of the day. I'm exaggerating, but, you know, you're lucky to get a handshake at the end of the day. Of course, I'm exaggerating a bit, but not too much sometimes, you know. But there are some directors that, that you work with that are crew directors, meaning that they respect the crew. They respect the the below the line. They respect the backbone of executing their vision. And then they look at the crew, 200 people later, they have to execute that vision. And they are savvy enough to understand that, to really be loving with the crew. Because if the crew respects you and loves you, they will do anything for you. Yeah. They will step out of their way, out of their box hours of time that's not on the clock, whatever it may be for you. Jonathan is one of those. He's a teddy bear. He's a loving person, a beautiful personality. He's one of those guys that will walk onto a set or walk into a, walk into a room or walk into a restaurant or whatever it may be. Everyone would gravitate him, gravitate towards him. He has that personality and he's a lovable guy and it's no bullshit. A lot of people will pay you compliments because they want to grab the best out of you. Uh, but, you know, they are very conditional that way. Jonathan is, is unconditional. He's, he truly loves people. He truly loves what you do. He truly loves working on Star Trek. He knows all about Star Trek. He has a lot of history with Star Trek. And his main job, as he says, and I appreciate him saying that to me as a cinematographer, Crescenzo, that's your job. You tell the story visually. I got some ideas. Let's talk about it. But that's your job. I want to tell a story with my actors. I want to be with my actors. I want to make sure they're giving the performances that I think these scenes particularly need. I want to know what the arcs are about and to carve these arcs with my actors. He's an actor-director. Right. Um, he knows the story very, very well. And then from there, he communicates that story with his actors. He's an actor-director. So by saying that is he relies on the crew to do what they are hired to do for them to do the best they can as to what's in their hearts creatively and their education of what they know about their particular craft, bring it to the table. I want to hear what you have to say. I want to see what you have to do. Um, and let's all be collective uh, in our thoughts, in our process of filmmakers and funnel it down to a single vision, which is always the director. The director always has the ultimate say at the end. And that's my job is to support as much as I can that director and his vision. And that's why prep is most important because it is my job to get inside the head of that director during prep. Not only technically, but where is this person going? What does he or she want? What is the visual language that they want to communicate and tell with this particular story? And you talk about the visual layers, the visual languages, and with all the tools that we have, they affect the visual language. And you need to hear that communication in order to know which direction you want to go. And then you got to figure out how to execute that direction. And then it all becomes within a time frame. Well, we got 12 hours to do this, seven pages. 
you know, we need the time frame now. Do we want a techno crane out there? Is it important? Or do we want to have that techno crane and keep the camera on a remote head and come through a window and let it fly through and be evocative about how we move that camera in a very hypnotic, subconscious, you know, space-like way? Or do we not want to have that piece of equipment, save the money and time, and come inside the set with handheld or with an easy rig camera and be a little more evocative the way the camera is moving to be a little more connected and not so polished with what the scene is about? And you talk about the equipment, sure. Naturally, you have to talk about the equipment. And on this show, we had a lot of equipment. You know, we had uh, techno cranes, you know, 50-foot technos. We had 23-footer Scorpio cranes. We had movies. We had uh, steady cams. We had a lot of pieces of equipment to execute a, a particular vision. From there, we would think really creatively uh, with discipline as to what to use that will tell the story in the best way as opposed to an indulgent way. Yeah. That's what our job was about. Yeah, the the indulgence is definitely something, you know, <laughs> going back to the idea of younger filmmakers, you know, you, you buy a gimbal and now everything's a gimbal shot, you know, <laughs> especially when it's your money, you know, you got to get your exactly bucks out of it or whatever. And it becomes humorous at times, to be honest with you, you know. Yeah. And that to but, me is when you see it, it separates the men from the boys. But it's always a growing process, you know. Young the discipline. Girls, they got to grow. Yeah. Um, you had, you had briefed them. I know we're, we're kind of coming up on time here, so, uh, sure. um, but, um, you had mentioned the Alex Kurtzman look, and like you said, he is kind of the godfather of, of modern Star Trek now. And I was wondering if, if there was, uh, maybe a, a non NDA violating way to <laughs> sort of describe what the, the Kurtzman look is and why so many people seem to have been drawn to it over the past handful of years. Well, that, that's a, that's a big question. And I'm going to see if I can articulate it. Uh, but his look, I know it sounds corny, uh, but it's not corny to those of us who have to execute it. Uh, his look is big movie. Hmm. He wants to execute the look as if we're doing a $300 million motion picture on the big screen. We don't think in the small screen, television, small screen. It's not that way anymore. Obviously we all have big, big systems, big TV screens, surround sounds, et cetera. Obviously, I show as you've seen, you know, get screened on IMAX now and in theaters at times, but looks great in IMAX. Speaking, mentally speaking, you know, he thinks in a very big movie feature way. And that's how we should tell our stories, thinking and disciplining ourselves that kind of way. You know, we rather do 10 great shots in one day than 40 mediocre pedestrian shots, you know, which ultimately becomes television shots you know television sometimes as you see can be very formulaic and very pedestrian at times simply because when you're executing a, a schedule of five seven nine ten pages a day and you only got seven eight days to execute a one hour drama script it becomes down to mathematics you know, how many shots do we have per day? How many are you allowed? What is the time? We cannot go more than 12 hours because of turnaround. Then the next day starts later, and we can't have that location because they have to start this time. So it becomes very precise. So as a result, you know, you're very disciplined on the amount of shots that we do with quality. And I'm a big fan of that. You know, I'd rather have quality than quantity. Personally, you know, if there's any directors hearing this, uh, I cringe. And we do so say it sometimes. Even sometimes I will say it sometimes. I cringe at the expression when a director says, let's just hose it down. Yeah, right. You know, let's just get as many cameras as we can. Let's just hose it down. Cover the shit out of it and we'll figure it out in post. You know, at times, you know, you know, I, I'd rather have one camera, possibly on a stunt, maybe a one -er, And on Star Trek Picard, we had a lot of intricate stunts that was executed as a one mm. which is ballsy, as opposed to getting five, six, seven cameras and hosing it down and then cutting it in, in quarter second flashes each time so frenetically, you know, that you get bombarded. You know, sometimes a one uh with integrity and class and classicalness, 
you become more involved in the the choreography, the structure, the body language, the form, the storytelling, the drama sometimes can be enhanced executing it that way. So, you know, it comes with experience. What can I say? And it comes yeah. with conversation. And every single person, every single director, every single script is different. And that's the beauty of what we do. Each thing we do, each week, each day, each shot we do is different. You know, you walk onto the set of Star Trek, you know, people say, oh, it's already lit. You know, there's a million lights up there. Again, ignorance. Yeah. Ignorance. The lights are up there. Fine. That saves us time to getting a ladder or a genie lift or a condor to rigging a light up there, choosing its gel, running cable, patching it to a board. Okay? It's up there already. That doesn't mean we're lit. It's right. just up there. Each job that we do, each episode that we do is differently. You know, we may be in the turbo lift a hundred times during an episode, but each time we're in there is different. Because is the light chasing? Is it flickering? Is it red? Is it blue? Is it red alert? Is it black alert? Is it beautiful and polished where the light is coming from the top? Or is it ominous when it just came out of something ready to go into a, a black alert onto the uh, onto the uh, you know the bridge of the ship? You know, these are all emotions. Is it one person standing there? Are they just looking straight? Or is it two people looking at each other? Requires different lights. Do we want to do a 360 around there, which I've done? You know, it requires different lighting. So these are intricacies that a lot of people are unaware of. And these are the mechanics that we do as filmmakers, especially with Star Trek, very, very involved, very detailed. Um, and it's extraordinary. You know, when you finally look at the finished product and hopefully, you know, you say, wow, that looked beautiful. That was fantastic. I felt what I needed to feel. But as a filmmaker who was there in the nucleus, you know, in the back of your mind, you step back. And you smile to yourself because you knew and you know how much it took to execute that. And it's just a wonderful thing. You know, things like all the video graphics on a screen. Right. You know, you got to come up with what information of those video graphics are on the screen. What information is it that we want to tell that story when a camera's looking at it of those video graphics behind the set? You know, there's an army of people in a small room with a thousand monitors with all kinds of computers feeding these graphics to those screens. And then as a cinematographer, you know, those screens are emitting light. You know, sometimes that's lighting the cast. Sometimes it's lighting it too much. You want to take the light away from those screens. But when you take it away, when you're photographing it, it's too dark. Or when you're lighting a subject, that light that's lighting the subject is sheening those graphics on the screen. It's just milking it out. So now it becomes really specific of your placement and angles of light. So you don't milk out those uh, graphics on the screen. So you can see it clearly in detail in proper ratios between the exposure of those graphics and the exposure of the face and the exposure of the background and possibly the exposure of the view screen window with visual effects out there. So there's so many dynamics involved when you're t doing a shot, it, it's yeah. extraordinary. Yeah. The, uh, well, <clears throat> I gotta say you, you did do, uh, you and, and John, were there any other DPs on uh season three, just you and John? Uh, for season three, it was just me and John. And in season two, I had uh, a, a, a partner of mine called Jimmy Lindsay, but season three was just John and I, he joined me on season three. Yes. Yeah. You guys did a, an excellent job. And, and like I said earlier, like I'm a, I would say a normalish fan of uh, Next Generation, but uh, I when I went to the, I was invited by a friend to the IMAX screening, and and uh, the energy in there was just yeah. insane because those were the, uh, as Mark Hamill calls them, ultra passionate fans, the UPS. Yes. You know, they're all dressed up and the whole thing. Yeah, um, and the response was just incredible. Very. <laughs> very hardcore the conversations in line for the popcorn i was like you know what i know what you're talking about but i have no fucking clue what you're talking about <laughs> uh but yeah man you guys did a great job um and and like i said we're coming up on time so i'm gonna have to let you go but uh would love to have you back on to keep talking about cinematography thank generally you, Kenny, i would like love that, that. i would yeah, love to thank you i feel like we're in the same uh mental space so we i appreciate that and i super appreciate the opportunity you know, to have this a forum and to speak with you like this. Thank you very much. Of course. Yeah. Anytime you want to come back, just let me know. Thank you, sir. I hope it will be soon. Thank you. 
Frame and Reference is an Owlbot production. It's produced and edited by me, Kenny McMillan, and distributed by Pro Video Coalition. As this is an independently funded podcast, we rely on support from listeners like you. So if you'd like to help, you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash frame and ref pod. We really appreciate your support. And as always, thanks for listening.